You're listening to public programs at the American Museum of Natural History. Would you trust a robot surgeon? Strap your kids into a driverless car? In this podcast, join Michu Kaku, author of the best-selling book, Physics of the Impossible, as he offers his predictions about how today's emerging technologies will affect life in the future. Dr. Kaku's talk was recorded at the museum on May 9th, 2011. We physicists love to make predictions. In fact, some of us physicists believe that perhaps the universe is infinite in space, infinite in time. So let me quote from that other great philosopher of the Western world, Woody Allen. Woody Allen once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. <laughs> and we physicists, well, we invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We helped to build the world's first computer. We wrote the World Wide Web. We also invented television. We invented radio, microwaves, radar, MRI scans, PET scans, almost everything you see in your living room, in a hospital, was invented by a physicist. And when we helped to create the internet, one physicist made a prediction. He predicted that his creation would one day become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. <laughs> but that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas of the world log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> So I've had the rare privilege of interviewing 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC television, for the Discovery Channel, for the Science Channel. And that's why I decided to write this book. You see, because when I was a kid, it all started when I was about eight years old. Everyone was talking about the fact that a great scientist had just died. It was front page of every newspaper on the earth. Albert Einstein had just passed away. And I'll never forget, they showed a picture of his desk. And the caption said, unfinished manuscript from the greatest work of our great scientist. And I said to myself, well, why couldn't he finish it? I mean, it was a homework problem, right? Why couldn't he ask his mother? I mean, what's the problem? Years later, I realized it was the unified field theory, the theory of everything. He wanted an equation one inch long that would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. So that was one role model I had. The other one was on Saturday mornings. I used to be glued to the TV screen watching Flash Gordon. And that introduced me to the world of aliens, spaceships, cities in the sky, invisibility shields, the world of the future. But then I began to realize something. I realized that I didn't have blonde hair, I didn't have blue eyes, and I certainly didn't have muscles. But I realized that it was a scientist who made the series work. And then I realized something that really changed my life. I began to realize that to understand the future, it helps to understand physics. Because we physicists, we invented most of the gadgets and the wizardry of the 21st century, 20th century, and now we are inventing the 21st century. So let me begin now to give you a guided tour of the future as told to me by 300 of the world's top scientists. Let me say that my previous book, hold on a second, was Physics of the Impossible. Could we just dim the lights a bit now? And that was also a New York Times bestseller, talking about teleportation, telepathy, psychokinesis, time travel, things that we may have beyond 100 years from now. But let's today talk about the next 10, 20, 50, and the next 100 years. Now, predicting the future is difficult. Abraham Lincoln, around 1860, was asked to predict the future of this great country of ours. And Abraham Lincoln said, 
Gentlemen, sometimes it is better to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Even if your friends think of you as a fool, rather than to open it up and remove all doubt. <laughs> well, let me open the mouths of 300 of the world's top scientists. In 1863, Jules Verne writes two books that are amazing. He predicts the next 100 years. He got the space shot to within 10% accuracy, the size of the capsule to within 10%, the launch site, Florida, touchdown in the ocean. He also got weightlessness correct. He got the fact that it took three days to reach the moon, three days to come back. How did Jules Verne get that so accurately? And then he did something even greater. In 1863, Jules Verne predicts Paris in 1960. He projects what Paris will look like a hundred years into the future. Well, the manuscript was so preposterous, so incredible, that they simply couldn't publish it. It's just too mind-boggling to assume that Paris in the 20th century would look like this. Jules Verne predicted in the time of the American Civil War, when most of us had wagons that were stuck in the mud, he predicted glass skyscrapers, fax machines, something like the internet, gasoline-fired cars. And I said to myself, how did Verne do it? Not one novel, but two, right on the button. And the way he did it was, every time a scientist went through Paris, he would pump them for all the information. What was the latest in rockets, the latest in submarines, the latest in building architecture? So Jules Verne interviewed all the top scientists that went through Paris. That's how he did it. So let's do a thought experiment. Let's now imagine the world of our grandparents and our great-grandparents, the world of 1900. How would they view us today? That's just 100 years ago. Talk to your grandparents, great-grandparents, and this is what you would find. First of all, people didn't live very long in 1900. You were lucky to get into your 40s. Life expectancy in the United States in 1900 was 49 years of age. Most people were dirt farmers. And long distance communication, that was yelling at your neighbor. <laughs> High speed travel, that meant riding in a wagon, usually in the mud, okay? Life was short and brutish in 1900. So if they were to look at us today, what would they think of us? They would think of us as wizards. Sorcerers. I mean, think about it. In 1900, imagine going to the moon. Imagine cars that have 300 horsepower in an engine. Bombs that could wipe out entire cities and the electrification of the planet Earth. Now, that's just in the last 100 years. You can talk to your relatives about this. There are people alive who remember this. However, now, let's talk about your grandkids, your great grandkids, how are your flesh and blood going to be living in the tw year 2100? As told to me by these scientists, they tell me that we will view them not as sorcerers and wizards. We will view them as gods, like Greek gods. And think of what the Greek gods could do. Zeus could simply mentally control objects around him. And we can do the beginnings of this now. Mental control of computers, just by wishing it, we can make things come true. Remember, I'm not a science fiction writer. I'm gonna show prototypes of everything in this lecture. And there are perks being a god too, you know. Hey, Venus had a perfect body and an ageless body. Not bad. And Apollo, he could ride across the heavens in a chariot. Yes, we will have our flying car. For you skeptics out there, we will have our jetpack and our flying car. And Pegasus was part horse, part bird. We will have zoos of extinct animals. We will be able to bring back extinct animals. So let's break it down. I'm now going to show you prototypes 
of the year 2100. By the way, my favorite Star Trek episode was this. Remember the Star Trek episode where they land on a planet and what do they meet on this planet? They meet Apollo, the god. And they say to themselves, oh my god, our 23rd century technology is useless against a god. But then they figure out, hey, now wait a minute, this is ridiculous. We're scientists. <laughs> this guy gets his energy from a computer, a power pack. They locate his power supply. They destroy his power supply, and then he's reduced down to an ordinary mortal. The point here is, to paraphrase Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. We used to fear the gods. One day, we will become them. And how will we do it? Well, first of all, there's something called Moore's Law. Moore's Law says the computer power doubles every 18 months. Now look at this on a log chart. Look at this curve. On a log chart, it's a straight line. You can set your watch to this curve. This is the source of the wealth of nations in the last 50 years. You realize that today, when you get a greeting card, happy birthday card, you open it up and sings happy birthday to you. There's a chip in that birthday card. That chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. <laughs> Hitler, Eisenhower, Churchill would have killed to get that chip that you get in the mail that sings happy birthday. And what do you do with it? You throw it away in the garbage. And your cell phone. Your cell phone today has more computer power than all of NASA in 1969 when they put two men on the moon. In fact, when you see all these old videos of the moonshot, look at those computers. 64K memory computers. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get into that space capsule knowing that I was backed up by 64K computers. <laughs> you have more in your cell phone than all of NASA. Well, look at this curve a straight line, and so we can take it out another easily into the future. Of course, it'll eventually run out, but I'll get into that later. So let's talk about it. The internet. Where will the internet go? It's already making enormous changes in the world. Look at the Middle East. Facebook, Twitter, changing the course of the Middle East, which has been static for centuries. And all of a sudden, Facebook and Twitter are changing the Middle East. Where will the internet be in the future? In the next 10 years, the internet will be, among other places, in your glasses. These are internet eyeglasses. They recognize people's faces, in fact. If you're at a meeting like this and you bump into somebody, you say to yourself, I know this person. Jim, John, Jay, I know this person. Who is he? I hope he doesn't come up to me and say hi to me. Well, in the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid, remember? <laughs> How many times do I have to remind you? This is only the second time this year you bumped into him. And if he speaks Chinese to you, it will translate Chinese into English. These glasses are almost ready for commercial development, okay? Just think, if you're a tourist in China, Italy, Germany, you'll hear exactly what people are saying in English as you read their subtitles. This is very handy, because if you're at a cocktail party, and you don't know who the heavy hitters are. In the future, you'll know exactly who to suck up to at any <laughs> cocktail party. And maybe you don't want to look like a refugee from Star Trek. In the future, it'll be trendy. Kids are going to love this technology. Think of it. You put on your glasses. You can download any video. You, this is the future of your home office, your home entertainment center. Pretty soon, fashion models will be wearing these things. They'll be part of your fall wardrobe, the fact that, of course, you're fully wired up. And let's say, however, that you don't necessarily like to put on glasses. What do you do if you don't like to put on glasses? No problem. For those of you who don't like glasses, we will put them in your contact lens. In the future, you will blink and go online. 
And who are the first people to buy the internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> They'll love it. Remember all those amino acids, all the sines and cosines that you had to struggle with? All those things, well, hey, in the future you'll blink. Which means that we professors are gonna have to give exams based on principles and concepts, not memorizing all the sides of a triangle and so on and so forth. And who are the second people to buy these things? Artists and architects. If you're an artist, you just wave your hand in the air and create gorgeous sculptures, works of art by waving your hands in the air. Architects don't have to redo their models whenever they do a building. They'll simply wave their hands, move towers, expand rooms, move the swimming pool, move the fountain. Architects will love this. Tourists will love this. When you're walking through the streets of Rome, there's not much left of the Roman Empire anymore. In the future, you'll blink and you'll see the entire Roman Empire resurrected right in front of you as you walk through the streets of Rome. The military is already perfecting this. Let's say you're in a multi-million dollar airplane and you're in a dogfight. The enemy goes underneath your airplane and you are are dead meat. You can't see the enemy. You don't know where the enemy is anymore. In the future, you'll have cameras underneath the airplane shooting the image into your contact lens, and you will see the enemy airplane underneath your feet. You will have X-ray vision. You'll be able to see right through objects with this device. I tell you, man, this is going to be big. And remember uh, in Star Trek, you have the holodeck? You just walk into a room and all of a sudden all these different kinds of peoples and things emerge in front of you. Well, welcome to the holodeck. This is a huge step toward the matrix and the holodeck, and this is coming real fast. Internet contact lenses, where you simply blink and access the database of the entire Earth. This is the future of your home office. If there's an emergency meeting at the home office, uh, all you have to do is blink, and there you are, participating in a meeting without ever having to leave the beach. <laughs> Very handy. And what is this called? This is a new vision. You know, 10, 15 years from now, we'll live in something called augmented reality, imposing information on top of reality. Now, virtual reality is for children. Virtual reality is when you see, you know, comic book characters, superheroes jump out at you. Augmented reality is for adults. Now, you've seen this before. You've seen this before. Where have you seen this before? Here is the governor of California <laughs> in a very bad mood. This is the Terminator robot. And look, this is augmented reality. Everywhere, the, everywhere Arnold Schwarzenegger looks, the target is identified. He knows exactly what he is looking at as he looks at it because subtitles emerge in whatever language and descriptions of the target, okay? So yes, you've seen this before. This is called augmented reality. And let's not talk about household appliances just in the next 10, 15 years. On the right is your wristwatch, fully internet capable, your wristwatch is your cell phone, full motion pictures, videos, songs on your cell phone. And have you ever tried to type a long letter on your cell phone? If you have fat fingers, you feel like jumping on your cell phone. But why? Why not simply unscroll plastic computer paper? This is the future of computer paper, plastic computers. This is called OLED technology, organic light emitting diode technology. And you simply unscroll the keyboard. So no matter how tiny your cell phone is, you can simply unravel it. And each dot in this flexible paper is a transistor. This gives new meaning for home decoration. Look on the right. On the right is flexible computer paper. This is the future of wallpaper. 
In the future, chips will cost a penny. That's the cost of bubblegum wrappers. Chips will cost a penny in 10 years. And therefore, you will, you will be able to buy wallpaper that is cheap as paper that is intelligent. So if you don't like the color of your wallpaper, you just talk to it and say, please change color, please change design. So you'll be able to talk right to your walls, okay? On the left is the future of your wallet. Today you have flat pictures of your loved ones in your wallet that simply sit there and don't do, don't do anything. In the future, you'll have full-blown motion pictures inside your wallet because your wallet will be intelligent. So remember that chips are going to be everywhere. Chips will cost a penny, and you'll talk to them, and they'll change color, change shape. Home decorating has never been so simple. And this is the future of your living room. Your living room will be 360 degrees wrapped around you. You'll sit back and create any reality that you want. So, for example, this is also the future of your love life. Let's say you're a college student and it's Friday night and you have no date. We all know what you do. You get stone drunk. In the future, you'll simply talk to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's available tonight? <laughs> Your wall screen will contact all the other wall screen of everyone else who's staring at their wall screen, wondering, what am I going to do tonight? So your wall screen already knows the kind of people you like. We'll set up a nice reservation at a restaurant automatically because it knows which restaurants you like. You'll come back and you'll say, mirror, mirror on the wall. My date and I want to see an old fashioned movie like Casablanca, except remove Humphrey Bogart's face and put my face instead. <laughs> and remove Ingrid Bergman's face and put my date's face instead. So chips will cost a penny, and so they'll be distributed everywhere in the environment, including toys. Toys are going to become intelligent at Christmas time, and this is causing a problem for the English language, a contradiction in terms called smart Barbie dolls. <laughs> Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. <laughs> that is also a contradiction in terms, OK? So here you are. This is basically the world of the matrix. You simply, when your contact lens and the wall screen, conjure up images of whatever you want to be, and the images will jump out at you. On the right is 3D television without glasses. Remember those clunky glasses that you have to put on for 3D? We can now do it without those glasses. Now here's how it works. That TV screen has thousands of vertical lines, thousands of vertical lines. Each vertical line is a prism. Therefore, when light hits that prism, it splits in half. One half to your left eye, one half to your right eye, and that's how you get 3D without those clunky glasses. So in the future, in your living room, you'll be surrounded 360 degrees by intelligent wallpaper, and on the left is the future of glass. You know, our kids are going to wonder, how could you, mom and dad, possibly live in a world where everything was stupid? I mean, <laughs> glass was stupid, tables were stupid. They just stood there and did nothing. You couldn't talk to them. You couldn't animate them. You couldn't do anything with windows. Well, on the left is intelligent glass. So let's say that you have a, a real old apartment and your view is really awful. You see the dump, a dump yard outside your window. Well, in the future, you just talk to the glass and say, I'm sick and tired of looking out at the dump yard. I want to see the Eiffel Tower. I want to see the Taj Mahal. And so you will have intelligent, intelligent windows in the future. And this is the future of your office. Remember, chips cost a penny. Therefore, the PC will disappear. The only place you'll find a PC is in a museum.
you'll simply scribble on sheets of paper and throw them away because the computer only costs a penny and the files follow you wherever you go. The scribblings are important. The computer is not important at all. This is called cloud computing. So you'll scribble, make notes, throw them away, and the files follow you everywhere you go, and that's called cloud computing, computing in the clouds. So the PC will disappear. Because, you know, when the Stone Age men created stone tablets, we don't have stone tablets anymore, so why should we bother to have computers? So computation will be everywhere. Everywhere and nowhere. Where is electricity today? The word electricity has pretty much disappeared from the English language. We don't say the word electricity anymore. We assume there's electricity in the walls, ceiling, floor. We assume that you simply flick switches everywhere you go and you get electricity. That's the future of computation. We will assume that everything is intelligent and you simply talk to it. This is your cubicle of the future. It'll be so beautiful, you'll never get any work done. <laughs> and this is your car of the future. Look at, look at the guy on the left. Try driving your car like that tonight. This is a driverless car. I had a chance to drive a car like this for BBC television. The car uses GPS to locate its position to within about six inches on a good day. This is the car that I actually drove for BBC television. There I was with my two hands on the wheel, and then the cameraman said, let go. And I said, what? He said, let go of the steering wheel. So I closed my eyes, I let go of the steering wheel, and there I was driving my car like this. Try that tonight. Try driving your car like this. Well, this is coming. Google is spending millions of dollars to commercialize this within about 10 years' time. In ten, the New York Times said eight years. But in about 10 years' time, you will simply jump into your car. The car will simply drive itself. Because, you know, some of you like to text messages while you drive. <laughs> That's kind of dangerous. Why not simply text messages and let the car drive itself? So, you know, the car will have very few accidents because this is actually safer than a human. Humans fall asleep, humans get drowsy, get distracted, and in New York, they have road rage. <laughs> in the future, your car will not have road rage. Uh, now, let me go back a bit. Hold on a second. Now, some people, when they see all these dazzling technologies just in the next couple of decades, maybe get a little bit afraid. They say, ooh, I'm going to be left behind. I don't know how to do these things. It's scary, the future. Well, people go through three phases. That's phase one. Phase one is they say, uh-oh, I'm getting old. I can't learn this stuff. Maybe the kids will learn it for me and teach me. Phase two, they begin to say, hey, this is useful. I could use this technology. I can communicate with my friends. I can talk to people around the world, hobbyists that I can't communicate with. I just talk to the wall, and I can talk to anybody. So people begin to say, hey, this is useful. Then stage three, people say, ha, I knew it all along. In fact, I invented it, right? <laughs> So you get used to it, basically, these technologies. So now let's talk about mid-century. Mid-century, we're going to live in a world like the Avatar, where we'll simply control machines with the mind directly, just like Zeus, the god. We're talking about telepathy and telekinesis, not hocus-pocus and psychobabble, but the real thing. We've made enormous inroads on this. Here's how it's done. This little boy has a helmet on. It detects radio emitted from the brain. Your brain emits radio. The radio is gibberish, it's nonsense, but slowly computer scientists are beginning to unravel the gibberish of radio that your brain sends out. Then we can actually send recognizable cities to objects and make them move. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the force. So again, we will have the force by mid-century, and some of it is available today. 
This gentleman on the right had a stroke. This person is like a vegetable, cannot move, communicate with his loved ones. At Brown University, they put a chip in his brain, connected the chip to a laptop. Here he is. And he can now surf the web, answer emails, write emails, he can uh, play video games, he can do everything you can do, except he is totally paralyzed. He cannot move at all. Now, last year I was at the World Science <clears throat> Festival. The honored guest was Stephen Hawking, my colleague. He now is at the point where he cannot move anything except his eyelids and facial gestures. He can only grimace and blink. That's all he can do. But in the audience for the reception, guess who I met? I met John Donahue, the man who invented this machine. So I think that one day when Stephen loses control of his eyelids, perhaps we will have direct control, direct contact with his brain using this method. So again, this is coming very fast. Now this is in Japan. In Japan, they've been able to take a worker, hook up a helmet, and the helmet picks up the radio emitted from your brain, deciphers it on the right, and shoots it to a robot. This is the movie Surrogates, starring Bruce Willis. If you saw that movie, Bruce Willis has an old aging body, but he mentally controls a robot that is young, handsome, virile, super strong, and lives forever. So why bother to have a human body that decays when you can mentally control a robot that lives forever, perfectly handsome, good looking, super strong, and can do almost anything that you can't do? I mean, what's not to like? Well, this is coming. Here is a demonstration. Unfortunately, it's not ready to be used in Japan at that nuclear accident. You probably saw what they're doing at that nuclear accident in Japan. They're shooting in robots that are controlled by a joystick. A joystick controlled robot. Robots ha that have the intelligence of a cockroach that can scurry around like a cockroach. This is not ready for prime time, which is very sad. Otherwise, they would shoot robots that can make repairs into that reactor. These robots, all they can do is take pictures. They can't make repairs. They can't even turn a screwdriver. That's how people don't realize how primitive computers are and robots. For example, you know that the robot IBM Watson beat the two gentlemen on Jeopardy? You probably saw that on Jeopardy, a robot beat two experts on Jeopardy. And the media was saying, oh my God, this robot is so smart, one day he's going to put us in zoos, make us dance behind bars, and throw peanuts at us. Well. That robot, Watson, was so stupid, you couldn't even go up to it to congratulate it that it won. It wasn't even aware of the fact that it won. I can't think of anything more useless than winning a prize and not even knowing you just won the prize. <laughs> so we can actually begin to see the outlines of lying. This is a brain on the left which tells the truth. You can see there's not much brain activity on the MRI scan when you tell the truth. On the right, the person is telling a lie. Now when you tell a lie, you have to know the truth, you have to create the lie, and you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the other lies you've been telling all these years. <laughs> That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. So we're making inroads, but it's still rather primitive. I'd say by mid-century, we'll be able to simply think and control objects around us. Now, there is a morality lesson here. One of my favorite movies was Forbidden Planet, came out in the 50s. In Forbidden Planet, there was an advanced alien civilization millions of years ahead of us. On the left, they had power plants that, that, were, that, that made the entire planet just burst with energy. On the right, they could create super robots. On the left, they could conjure up images just by thinking about it. And then one day, they created their most advanced device. It gave them the power of a god. They can think 
and their wishes came true. That was the pinnacle of their power, mental control of reality. So the very day they turned on the machine, they disappeared. The very day they turned on this machine that would grant them the power of a god, they disappeared. And at the end of the movie, they finally reveal what happened to the aliens. When the aliens built that machine, mentally anything they dreamed of would come true. But then that night, they fell asleep. And when they fell asleep, they had nightmares. And these nightmares came true, and they committed suicide in one night. So we don't have to wait for millions of years. We're going to have this technology in 50 to 100 years. The lesson is, don't fall asleep. <laughs> now let's say a few things about the biotech revolution. We talk first of all about Zeus. Zeus was the god who can simply think, and it would come to be. Now let's talk about Venus. Perfect bodies, per timeless bodies. First of all, this was Fantastic Voyage, uh, where they shrink Raquel Welch and put her into your bloodstream. The critics just howled in laughter at the idea of shrinking Raquel Welch and having her float inside your bloodstream. But actually, we're going to have something very similar to this very soon. Let's ask a question. How small can you make a chip? A very simple question. This is a chip that is small enough you could put inside an aspirin pill. And there's a TV camera shown here. This actually exists. The TV camera and the chip you swallow, and there's a magnet that guides it inside your stomach, and it takes pictures. And of course, we all know that middle-aged men fear the C word, colonoscopy. This gives you a complete readout of your colon. And this gives new meaning for the expression, intel inside. <laughs> so that's how small you can get a computer. And now, nanoparticles, which are molecules, can actually locate and even kill individual cancer cells in the lab. Now, this is big. We all know that chemotherapy is horrible. Your hair falls out, you vomit, you feel awful. Well, now we scientists are perfecting nanoparticles that are smart bombs. Smart bombs that can zero in on individual cancer cells. This is really big. This is going to change everything. 90% kill in one experiment. This is not science fiction now. We can make molecules that home in on individual cancer cells. Now, how do we detect cancer before it forms? Ladies and gentlemen, you're now looking at our first line of defense against cancer. Your toilet. In the future, your toilet will have DNA chips in it. Your DNA chips will, first of all, detect that you eat too much, too much sugar, too much salt in your diet. Isn't the future wonderful? Even your toilet will tell you that your health is awful. However, the DNA chips are amazing because these DNA chips shown here can detect individual enzymes and proteins from cancer colonies of 100 cancer cells 10 years before a tumor forms. Ladies and gentlemen, these chips here will make the word tumor disappear from the English language. You know that Aretha Franklin is dying of pancreatic cancer? You know who else has pancreatic cancer? Steve Jobs of Apple Computer. We used to think that pancreatic cancer was aggressive, inevitably kills you in a few years, but we were wrong. We've sequenced the genes now of pancreatic cancer, and we were shocked. We now know that instead of being fast-growing aggressive, it is the opposite. It takes up to 20 years, 20 years for pancreatic cancer to grow. And then in the last few years, you feel it. You don't feel anything for 18 or so years. And then in the last few years, it kills you very rapidly. In the future, these chips will pick up proteins, enzymes, and, a, and tiny amounts of cancer cells and tell you, oh, by the way, you have 18 years to take care of this cancer before it kills you. I tell you, man, this is big. 
we're going to be able to detect cancer and cure cancer very soon. Again, maybe another 10, 15 years before the FDA approves the technology and so on and so forth. But these DNA chips already exist, so sensitive, they can pick up individual proteins, enzymes, and also individual cancer cells. Now, in Star Trek, we saw the tricorder. People laughed at that. It's a device that you wave in front of somebody, and immediately you know what's inside their body and what's wrong with them. Ha! Well, it's coming. The tricorder. First of all, on the left is an MRI machine. It looks inside your body. In fact, when I was in high school, uh, my advisor, well, I had a summer job at Varian Associates, my advisor was Paul Ernst. He won the Nobel Prize in physics for inventing that machine on the left. Well, that machine looks inside your body. It's a huge machine, and on the right is the world's smallest MRI machine. It is the size of a PC. And in Germany, where they make that machine, they claim that the smallest possible tricorder is the size of a cell phone. So in the future, you will have, first of all, a doctor in your wallpaper. When you want to talk to a doctor and it's the middle of the night, you know that doctors hate to make house calls, hate to come in the middle of the night, you simply talk to the wall. The wall's intelligent and an animated doctor appears that answers 95% of all the questions you have. The remaining 5% requires a tricorder. And you simply take it out of your bathroom. It's the size of a cell phone. It looks inside your body, looks for DNA and, and things of different diseases. And you'll have a doctor in your bathroom. This is going to cut down medical costs. Because anybody will be able to detect cancers, diseases, simply by waving a cell phone in front of their bodies. So this is coming very soon. Now, let's say a few things about DNA. I had my DNA scanned by BBC television. I gave some of my blood to BBC, and they sent it to a laboratory because I was curious. My mother died of Alzheimer's disease. It's a horrible disease to die of. You lose your memory. You don't even recognize your own children. Eventually, you don't even recognize yourself. But we know some of the genes that contribute to Alzheimer's, the APOE4 gene. And I was curious, do I have the APOE4 gene? Well, BBC television put a TV camera in front of my face and said, we want to know your reaction when we tell you if you have this gene or not. So there it was, the camera was rolling, and they announced right in front of the camera, you do not have the APOE4 gene. And so I told the TV camera that the anxiety I felt will be felt by millions of people in the future when all of us have a complete readout of all our genes on a CD-ROM. This is our owner's manual. You have an owner's manual for your TV set, your laptop. You have an owner's manual for everything except one thing, you. You have no owner's manual. And what are we going to do with it? We're going to grow organs of the body. This is an ear. The ear is made out of plastic. It's biodegradable. You seed it with cells from your ear. It proliferates your own cells now. And the plastic dissolves, leaving a perfect ear. On the left is bone, on the right is ears. We can now grow from your own cells, so there's no rejection mechanism. Bone, cartilage, ears, nose, blood vessels, uh, heart valves. The first heart valve was grown uh, a few years ago. First bladder was grown in 2007. The first windpipe was grown just last year. And in five years, we will grow the first liver. So for all you alcoholics out there, <laughs> take heart. Remember that Mickey Mantle died of liver failure. We will simply grow a new liver and a new pancreas. This is the human body shop. This is coming because we can now grow these organs. And of course, this is, raises a question because we're also finding the gene that makes certain mice smart. This is a smart mouse gene. This is a typical mouse on the left. A very timid, uh, not very uh, assertive, very recessive. And this is the smart mouse on the right, okay? 
that, that should be the, the magazine of the American uh, Museum of Natural History on the right. And so, well, we have that smart mouse gene in our bodies, too. And this is the mighty mouse gene. This is a regular mouse on the left, and the mighty mouse on the right, it's double the muscular weight of an ordinary mouse. It turns out that a boy in Germany had the same gene. He was also born muscle-bound, so they couldn't call it the mighty mouse gene anymore. Now we call it the Schwarzenegger gene. And the Olympics are worried about this because you can't, you can't detect this using steroid tests. So this is going to be a problem for the future. One of my friends is on the Olympic Committee, in fact, realizing that in the future, we may root for the home team, the Yankees or whatever, on the basis of who has the best coach, who has the best training method, and who has the best geneticist. <laughs> Because our teams, look, how do you stop this? This is something the Olympic Committee is looking at right now. And the aging process. We now are unraveling the genes which control aging. This is big. Our grandkids may have the option of hitting the age of 30 and simply cruising at the age of 30 for several decades. This is well within the range of physical possibility because, for example, we know that different animals age at different rates. The chimpanzee has a lifespan, 50% our lifespan, and yet we are 98.5% genetically identical to the chimpanzee. A handful of genes separates us from the chimpanzee, yet we live twice as long as a chimpanzee. I tell you, man, this is big. The genes which control the aging process are among a handful of genes that separate us from the chimpanzee. Also, by the way, alligators and crocodiles, do you know that they may live forever? They have no known lifespan. Now, in a textbook, they usually say the alligator lives to be the age of 70. But that's because that's when the zookeeper died. <laughs> no one has ever seen an alligator or crocodile even age, let alone die of aging. They simply get bigger. They're just as virile at 90 as they are at 5. So in Mother Nature, okay, uh, animals, some animals just live forever. Now, of course, in the wild, they die of starvation, they die of disease. But in zoos, in zoos, they just keep on going. No one has ever seen an alligator, crocodile, or a flounder uh, age with time. So we are now zeroing in on the genes which control the aging process. Now, let me just say a few things about outer space. Late in the 21st century, outer space may be finally conquered by the space elevator. This is Jack and the Beanstalk all over again. The Beanstalk allowed Jack to climb his way into heavens, just like this. What keeps the space elevator afloat? It's centrifugal force. If I have a ball on a string like this, what keeps the ball on a string? Centrifugal force. So therefore, if this is made out of nanofibers, the toughest fibers known to science, carbon fibers, a molecule thick, we may be able to build a space elevator perhaps by the end of this century. So outer space may be opened up when you simply get into an elevator and push the up button and you too could become an astronaut. Even if you were a coward, you can simply hit the up button and soar like an astronaut into outer space. Somebody once asked me whether I wanted to be an astronaut. And I told them that I would rather not sit on two million gallons of gasoline, <laughs> knowing that 1% of the time it blows up. Now let's say a few things about the frontiers of astronomy and the frontiers of my field, theoretical physics. You realize that most of the universe is dark. Every single textbook of astronomy, physics, and chemistry is now being rewritten. They're all wrong. All the textbooks say that the universe is mainly made of atoms. We now know that is wrong. Every single textbook is now being rewritten, even as we speak. 23% of the universe is made out of dark matter. If I had dark matter in my hand right now, it would be invisible. You couldn't see it. 
It would go right through my fingers, because it has no electric charge. It would go right through the floor of New York City, go all the way to the crust of the Earth, and go to China, where it would emerge in a Chinese planetarium, a piece of dark matter, and it would rise, come to a halt, and go back down again through the center of the Earth, all the way back to New York City, and it would oscillate back and forth between China and New York City. That's dark matter. What is it? Here is a map of dark matter. The Hubble Space Telescope treats dark matter like glass. Glass is invisible. So how do you know that glass is there? Because light is distorted as it goes through glass. So look at this. This is now how the Hubble Space Telescope views the galaxies. There it is. There is dark matter. What is it? Nobody knows. In fact, it was a woman, Vera Rubin, who may win the Nobel Prize eventually. But in the 1960s, Vera Rubin was on to it, but people thought she was crazy. Why? First of all, when Vera Rubin talked about dark matter in the 60s, well, let's be blunt about this. She was a woman. Women scientists historically were discriminated against in, in the sciences. Let me tell you a really sad story. Jocelyn Bell was perhaps the one who suffered the most. She was a graduate student in astronomy in the 60s. She saw a star blink at her. Now, stars twinkle. They don't blink. They twinkle because of imperfections in the, in the air. Uh, currents in the air, but they don't blink regularly. Jocelyn Bell saw a blinking star. She registered it day after day, cold day after cold day, week after week, months after months, logged all the motions of this big discovery. And then she made the biggest mistake of her life. She told her thesis advisor, when it was time to write the paper, whose name came first? His name, because he was the big shot professor, was his experiment. When it was time to give talks around the world, who gave the talks? He gave the talks. And when it was time to win the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the pulsar, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics? He did. What's the lesson here? The lesson is, if you ever make a big discovery, tell me first. <laughs> I'm a generous man. I can give you a subway token for your great discovery. But hey, look, your name can't go first. I mean, you can't give talks around the world, right? I mean, you know, let's be fair about this. OK, but anyway, what is dark matter? We hope to create dark matter on Earth. This is the Large Hadron Collider's main detector. It is 17 miles in circumference. And we hope to create dark matter with a machine on the Earth. We think that most of the universe matter is actually dark matter. 23% is dark matter. 4% is hydrogen and helium of the stars. And what about us? What about lithium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, tungsten, tin? What about us? We make up, ta-da, 0.03% of the universe. This is humbling. We make up 0.03% of the universe. We're the oddballs. We're made out of nuclear waste. You know that? We're made out of nuclear waste. The stars burn hydrogen and helium. We are the residue. So if the Large Hadron Collider can create dark matter, what is dark matter? Well, we string theorists believe that it is nothing but a higher vibration of a string. You know, when I got my PhD at Berkeley years ago, I had to memorize the names of all the god darn subatomic particles. Lambda particles, tau mesons, quarks, up down, strange, Yang Mills particles, Higgs bosons, hundreds, thousands of subatomic particles in order to get your PhD from Berkeley. I would hope that in the future, when you get your PhD from Berkeley, all you would have to do is say, string theory and get your PhD. I mean, back in the 50s, we were drowning in subatomic particles. In fact, Oppenheimer, the man who created the atomic bomb, once solemnly declared that the Nobel Prize in physics should go to the physicist who does not discover a new particle this year. <laughs> 
So we think that all the subatomic particles are nothing but musical notes like this on a tiny vibrating string. A, B flat, C sharp, nothing but vibrations of a rubber band. But the rubber band has higher octaves. And what are these higher octaves? Dark matter. So we think that dark matter is nothing but the next octave on a tiny vibrating rubber band. Now, what else can you do with it? You can also, with string theory, we hope, answer what happened before the Big Bang. Is time travel possible? Are wormholes possible? Are other dimensions possible? We think that these may be answered by string theory. String theory, by the way, is what I do for a living. That's my day job. A multiverse of universes. This is the picture coming from string theory. The picture coming from Einstein is that we live on a bubble. It's a very big bubble. The bubble is expanding, and we're stuck like flies on flypaper on the skin of a bubble. But then even children ask the question. Children ask, if the universe is expanding, then what is it expanding into? Well, if the universe is everything there is, and everything there is is expanding, how can it expand into anything else? Well, the answer is the universe is expanding in hyperspace. That's the title of my first book. Another dimension. But there are other universes, other bubbles, we think, that are out there. And sometimes these bubbles collide with each other. Sometimes they fission in half. When they collide or they fission in half, we think that could be the Big Bang. So the Big Bang could be nothing but the collision or the budding of these bubbles. So how do you go from one bubble to the next? Well, that's very hard. But the way we do that is through something called the looking glass. The looking glass of Alice. You see, wormholes were introduced 150 years ago in the English language by a mathematician at Oxford University by the name of Charles Dodgson. He was a mathematician at Oxford. He knew about multiple connected spaces. That's the mathematical term for it. But he couldn't write a novel about them because the people of Victorian England would reject it. So what did he do? He wrote it as a children's book. And he gave himself a pen name, Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll is not Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll is Charles Dodson, professor of mathematics at Oxford University. Queen Victoria was so enchanted by Alice in Wonderland that she wrote him a letter and said, please, please, please give me your next book, which he did. It was a treatise on higher mathematics <laughs> that he sent to Queen Victoria. Well, these wormholes were introduced by Einstein himself and Rosen in 1935. So is it possible to go through the wormhole, a gateway between bubbles? Well, we're not sure about this. The mathematics is quite daunting. Stephen Hawking thinks that in one particular frame, it is possible to actually leave one bubble and perhaps go to the next bubble, to go from one universe basically to another universe. Of course, your technology has to be very advanced to do this. We physicists rank civilizations in three types. In outer space, an advanced civilization that controls planetary energy is called type one, like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. They control the weather. They control earthquakes, that's type one. Type two, they control stars. That's the federation of planets of Star Trek. Star Trek would be a typical type two civilization. Then there's type three, capable of this. Type three is galactic, okay? In fact, who can tell me the name of the only type three civilization on network television on Star Trek? It eats type two civilizations for breakfast. It's the Borg, right? The Borg is a type three civilization. Now, I gave a talk uh, at the London Planetarium, a, a sister to this planetarium in London several years ago before it, it finally was remodeled and changed. A little boy comes up to me, 10 years of age, a real pest. <laughs> he comes up to me and he yanks on my pants and he says, 
Professor, you're wrong. <laughs> There's type four. So he looked down on this little 10-year-old boy. And I say to the 10-year-old boy, shut up, kid. <laughs> Why don't you go play in traffic? There's a nice intersection over there. And no, this little pest wouldn't go. He kept yanking on my pants. And he said, Professor, you are wrong. There's type four. <coughs> and then I said, look, kid, there are planets, stars, and galaxies. Therefore, any advanced civilization would be planetary, type one, stellar, type two, or galactic, type three. And he said, no, there's something beyond the galaxy, the continuum. Now, who can tell me where is the only type four civilization on network television? The Q. The Q, very good. Now, if you did not understand what just transpired, get with the program. <laughs> it's on Star Trek. A type four civilization, a civilization beyond anything that we can conceive of. And so one day, perhaps if we become masters of string theory, who knows? String theory, each solution is an entire universe, a baby universe. We play with baby universes. When I get up in the morning, I say to myself, I'm going to be God today. I'm going to create a baby universe in the laboratory. And so this is what our problem is, to create a baby universe like this, which will then expand to create the universe that we see today. And one day, it's going to get awfully cold. Awfully cold because the latest theory shows that the universe will die in ice. You know, the Earth will die in fire when we go back into the sun five billion years from now. The sun will die in ice when its nuclear fires are exhausted and it becomes a dwarf star. Our galaxy will die in fire when we're eaten alive by Andromeda, when we collide with the Andromeda galaxy. Our galaxy will end in fire, but the Earth, no, no, the universe will die in ice. And there's only one way to evade the death of the universe, and that is leave the universe. So one day, perhaps, string theory may give us a way out of the death warrant that physics seems to give us. Perhaps it's not fated that we will all die in ice rather than fire. Well, let me now end on one last note. I had the privilege of speaking at the Einstein Centennial a few years ago. And my favorite Einstein joke is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache, I will put on a wig, and I'll be the great Einstein, and you can take a rest and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved practical jokes, so they switched places. This went on great, until one day a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And then Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question, is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, you keep that. You keep that. Uh, Dmitri has agreed to hang out for some Q&A. That's sometimes the best part because you get to say what's on your mind, because he's been telling you what's on his mind. But I'm gonna take host privileges and start off with the first question. Mm -hmm. Are you not disturbed by the possibility that our universe is somebody else's experiment? <laughs> St uh, demented string theorists from another universe? This is some physics lab at Caltech in another universe inventing us and looking. It's something out of, out of uh, what's that movie? Men in Black. Men in Black, Men right. In Black. The final scene, the right? The final scene. Where everything we know and see is nothing but a marble game so, <laughs> Play, you'd, played by some aliens. You're apparently not disturbed by that possibility because you didn't mention it at all. 
No, I'm not disturbed at all that we could be part of a much larger scheme of things that our universe could have sister or parallel universes, right? I mean, just think about it. Uh, Elvis Presley could still be alive in another one of these universes, right? Uh, okay, I don't, the, it boggles I don't mind, the imagination. I don't mind the parallel universe. It's just that we'd be somebody's lab experiment. That, that's all. Mm -hmm. That's what disturbs me. Well, some people who talk about the Omega Point, which I don't believe in, think that the universe is nothing but a CD-ROM. A CD-ROM that somebody puts into a cosmic PC and pushes the play button. So everything you see around us is nothing but somebody hitting the play button on a CD-ROM <laughs> in some <laughs> universal PC. I don't think I believe that. That would be like the Matrix thing, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's go to the floor for questions you might have. Yes, sir. So in the uh, conversations you had with those 300 scientists, did you touch upon the ethical dimensions of some of what they were uh, positing? Oh, yes, yes. People were very much aware of the fact that what they were doing has, has consequences. For example, I interviewed almost all the key players in artificial intelligence theory. And there are three groups of people debating what happens when robots eventually become as smart as us. The first group say that they are our children and we should let them take over. If they put us in zoos, so be it, because they are our evolutionary successor. They deserve to take over because they're stronger, more beautiful, smarter than us. We should pr be proud. They are our children. Even if they, if they put us in a nursing home, they are our children. That's one group. The second group said, over my dead body, <laughs> I'm going to get a shotgun and blow their mechanical brains out, and I'm going to put a chip in their brain a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have any murderous thoughts. And I'm going to talk to Harrison Ford and recruit robot fighters to take on these rogue robots. That's the second group. Then there's a third group. But Michio, who, it, this puts new meaning to the, he's got a chip on his shoulder. There's a, a chip in his brain, just, you know. A chip in his shoulder, right? The third group, the third group said, let us merge with our creations. Let us use biotechnology and artificial intelligence. Why not wake up one day immortal? Why do we have to get old? Why, why can't we be immortal with, with a bioengineered and mechanically engineered body? When one day we meet aliens from outer space, they're not going to look like squishy aliens with five legs coming out of a spaceship. They may be mechanically enhanced, genetically enhanced. They may not even look like what their ancestors were like. So the third group says, let us merge. Don't fight them. Join them, basically. Well, my personal attitude is this is at least 100 years away. And all her great grandkids will engage in this debate about what to do when the robots become as smart as us. But it's an ethical question that, yeah, the, the people who work in the field actively debate almost all the time. Another question back here. Uh, yes, when you're talking about 100 years ago, you left out a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, they did have uh, high speed communications back there. It was called telephones and telegraph, and they was, did have uh, railroads. Yeah, the, it turns out that if you were privileged to have access to it, then you could send a, a telegraph wire. But it was not for the average person. The average person was basically dirt farmers. And yeah, they did have steam locomotives at that time. But most people did not have access to steam locomotives. There were whole parts of the planet Earth whole parts of the planet Earth that were totally devoid of any of these, uh, any of these things. Still are, in fact. Still are. Yes. <laughs> By the way, thank you, Professor, for coming. Big fan. I wanted to ask you, as Ray Kurzweil um, says in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2047, that's a singularity, um, and with Moore's law doubling every 16 months, what's your thoughts on uh, Moore's law? Is it, you're saying it's going to end, but um, wouldn't be if computers are smarter every every 16 months, wouldn't it be closer when the singularity's coming about? Wouldn't it be that the computers are going to be smart enough to figure out how to keep going with Moore's Law? Okay. First of all, the singularity is when robots surpass us in intelligence and then create children 
that are smarter than them, and the kids create grandkids that are smarter than the grandparents, and it exponentially goes until they take over the entire universe. Well, there are some problems. First of all, Moore's Law that I gave you will probably flatten out in 10 years' time. I spoke in Zurich last year to the physicists at IBM Zurich, and they tell me that they can see it now. They can already see the flattening out. You saw the New York Times just last week. Uh, Intel is desperately going to the third dimension, creating three-dimensional chips, because exactly for this problem, they see the end coming. So I'd say that another 10 years time, we'll squeeze every little bit we can out of Moore's Law. 3D chips, X-ray, crystallography, as much as we can. But in 10 years time, it'll be over. It'll be over, it'll be flat. Now, would you buy a Christmas present with a chip in it, knowing that it is just as powerful as the previous year's Christmas model? No. Why bother to upgrade? Why bother to get the next video game when they're all equally powerful? So this could create off a recession if this happens. Now, we physicists are desperately trying to create the next generation beyond silicon, the post-silicon era. Because Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. A rust belt, just like Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania is a rust belt. We could have another rust belt in Silicon Valley. So we physicists are creating molecular computers. In fact, Ray actually prefers molecular computers. Quantum computers, quantum dot computers, laser computers, optical computers, protein computers, and quantum dot computers. None of them are ready for prime time. So I interviewed Ray. He's been on my radio program several times, and I asked him, What's going to happen when Moore's Law finally peters out? And his answer was, well, you physicists will find something. <laughs> well, I'm a physicist, and we don't know what the post-silicon era is going to look like. It's a big question mark. Quantum computers compute on individual atoms. But the world's record for a quantum computer calculation is 3 times 5 is 15. That is the world's record for a quantum computer calculation done by IBM. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but tonight, go home, take five atoms, and multiply three times five is 15 on five atoms. And you begin to realize how difficult it is to make quantum computers. So the answer to your question is nobody knows. Another question here. Are you worried about, um, with the screens, people losing their grips on actual reality, no longer going outside and doing things like going to the park and things that we do every single day. Right. I don't go outside now. I mean, I stay home, got a big flat panel, I, I just stay home. And meet you. What do we have? What's the future of this? When the telephone first came out, there were editorials denouncing the telephone. People said that we're not going to have dinner table conversations anymore. We're going to pick up the phone and talk to this disembodied, faceless voice from the ether. And the critics were absolutely right. We don't talk so much to our circle of friends. We talk to this disembodied voice, and we love it. We love it because our circle of friends expanded from 10 people. The average person in those days only talked to maybe 10 people, right? from 10 to 100 people. And now with the internet, we can go up to a billion people. And so the internet is something about touching people. That's what it's really all about, even though we don't play outside so much anymore. Because you see, when the internet was first created, it was male. It was about dominating over the Soviet Union in a World War III conflict. I know, I'm a physicist, I've been on the internet for decades, and it was a war fighting device. We knew on the internet it was supposed to communicate between scientists during a nuclear war. Now, the internet is female. 51% of the users are female. It's about touching people. It's no longer about dominating over the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. It's about reaching out and touching people. And some of the first people to be affected by the internet are people in nursing homes. You know, I visit a nursing home. I visit my mother's nursing home. It's awful. People just sit there waiting to die. Their kids don't visit them anymore. They're losing their mind. They're losing all contact with reality. Now you go to a nursing home, but a lot of them are wired up. They're playing bridge with people from around the world. Kids today think nothing of playing computer games with kids on the other side of the planet Earth. They feel more in common with somebody in Russia or Spain than they do their next door neighbor. 
And I think all of this is a good thing. Why? Because in the history of the world, no two democracies have ever warred with each other. Think of every war you've learned about since you were in grade school. Every single war. None of them have been between two democracies. And the internet is about democratization. There's a price to pay. We don't play outside as much as we used to. But hey, look at the Middle East. It's been stagnant for 100 years. And now it's boiling with activity because of Facebook and Twitter. Who would have thought? And so I think it's a good thing that we spend time touching people. And that's what the internet is all about. The internet is female. And uh, Micho is another interesting war fact. America has never gone to war against a country that had a McDonald's in it. Just a little, <laughs> oh, just a little fact. Uh, we're actually my day. running short on time, uh, with less time than I thought, but there'll be time to chat with Micho outside. We'll go one last question here, sir. Uh, this question is, is either to you, Dr. Akaku, or, or to yourself, Dr. Tyson. I see a lot of younger people here tonight, like early teens, even younger. We think you're young, by the way, so just, <laughs> just. Go on. That's why I had to specify the, the teens. <laughs> but um, if, if, there was, if there was one one piece of advice you could give to them in their journeys through science in the future, either personal or what you've seen from somebody else. Oh, about young people. Be? Well, look, I've had a chance to interview. He wants to send them into traffic. We've, esta <laughs> we've established it. So I think I should take this. I, 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 Michio, I don't know if you're qualified, given what you yeah. said earlier. But we'll give you a second chance. Go. <laughs> Well, I've asked similar questions to hundreds of scientists on my radio show. I asked them, at what point did you decide to become a scientist? And they always say the same thing, at age 10. It's always the same thing, at age 10. Before then, everything's mommy and daddy, mommy and daddy. After age 10, it's a telescope. It's a trip to the planetarium. Quite a few people said it was this planetarium that set them off to become a Nobel Prize winner. It was a chemistry kit. It was an astronomy book. Something set them off with this great journey to become a great scientist. And then when they're 16, it's all over. <laughs> it ends. At 16, the hormones kick in, peer pressure, people call you a nerd, and so on and so forth. But those six years, six great years of discovery, innovation, creativity, imagination, that keeps you going forever. That's your booster rocket, man. That's what takes you right there into the 11th dimension. And so for me, I'd like to tell people that when you're young, we're born scientists. Every one of us is born wondering why the stars shine and where we came from. We're born scientists until we hit high school. Those are the danger years, okay? Watch out when you hit high school. But before then, these are great years that send them off to discover the universe. Join me in giving a nice, warm New York thank you to Michio Kaku. Okay, great, thanks.